Okay, so yesterday we saw a look at Islam. We, we saw Islam through the eyes of Muslims. We understood the religion as it's practiced as far as the five pillars are concerned, the six articles of faith. We got a pretty good introduction to all that. Uh, you heard my testimony, my personal walk, um, and how the Lord brought me to the truth. Um, and we got a quick look into Sharia, into Hadith, etc. All that was so that you can have a basis to understand Muslims and the way they think, the way they see the world, to see the world through their eyes. It really, really matters. When you are trying to share the gospel with someone, when you're trying to convince them of anything, you need to be able to understand what they see and how they see it in order to be convincing. Uh, we can't assume certain things that aren't there. We can't assume they think the way we think. We, we can't assume that they see things the way we do. Uh, of course, every Muslim is different, and some of them are extremely westernized and individualistic, and a lot of them are more traditional in their approach. So yesterday should have given you a good smattering of, uh, of the perceptions that Muslims have. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be taking a look at some of the more critical issues regarding Islamic studies. Now, I focus again on the origins of Islam. I focus on Muhammad. I focus on the Quran. The rest of Islam, very intriguing, very interesting, a rich tapestry of history but it does not have the same apologetic emphasis that the origins of Islam has. And so we're gonna be focusing on the origins. We're gonna be taking a brief look at scholarship. So we're gonna be looking at approaches to Islamic studies and the origins that are there. And then we're gonna be considering our approach in light of the various approaches that are out there in scholarship. Then we're gonna take a look at the historical Muhammad. We're gonna look at his life, what we can know, uh, and given certain approaches, what our conclusions would be. And then we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight looking at the Quran, the history, understanding its composition, compilation from a critical as well as a Muslim perspective. Now, I did get a little feedback yesterday insofar as the breaks were perhaps a bit too short. Um, we will be taking a bit longer breaks, so hopefully, hopefully um, your bladders will be well maintained. <laughs> Don't want to risk that. So let's take a brief look at scholarship. Where I'm pulling this from is from Fred Donner's narratives of uh, Islamic origins. So this is basically his summary of the way Islamic studies have gone, critical Islamic studies. Uh, this is not uh, definitive by any means, but I find it to be a good description of the way Islamic studies have evolved over the past few centuries. Now what you had from the inception of Islam all the way until about the 17th century, were, uh, as far as Western non-Muslim scholarship was concerned, was a lot of criticism of Islam, uh, a lot of total ignoring of their sources. No one really looked at the Islamic history from the Muslim perspective. No one looked at the Hadith. No one looked at the Sita. They were pretty much recounting Islam's history from their own perspective. Um, and there was a breakthrough in studies which Fred Donner calls the descriptive approach. Starting in about the 17th century, people started using the Islamic narrative in order to discuss Muhammad's life, the life uh, of the caliphs after that, and the progression of Islam. So the first approach that we'll be looking at is this, the descriptive approach. And it was a breakthrough in its, in its time. Now there are three main assumptions of the descriptive approach to Islamic studies. The first is that the Quran is practically documentary in its value. In other words, the Quran, what you read from the Quran tells us exactly what Muhammad was like. It tells us what he said. It is the earliest source. Uh, looking at it chronologically, um, the Quran came in the early 7th century. And so if we read the Quran, we will have word for word what Muhammad taught. We will have a good idea of what people responded to him with. The, the issues, the problems that existed in his community, the Quran, will give us a good understanding of that. Uh, does that make sense, uh, how that approach would work? And a lot of people adhere to that today. In addition to this, the descriptive approach also took the general contours of the Islamic narrative into account. In other words, the general framework of how Islam came to be today that Muhammad came at about the year 570 and that after 40 years uh, in 610 AD he started his ministry, it became public three years later and, and then he had this hijra in 622 and then he died in 632 and then the, the caliphs came after that. This general contour, this narrative of Islam uh, is reported in Islamic sources, the akhbar, the reports. And this was assumed by the descriptive approach to be generally trustworthy. 
Now, as far as the hadith are concerned, specific details, specific statements that are made by Muhammad, etc., the descriptive approach discounted those. Uh, they said, well, those are more so of a religious nature, they're more of a liturgical nature. We don't actually trust that for historical value. If it weren't for that caveat, by the way, if it weren't for the fact that the descriptive approach didn't really give historical credibility to the hadith, it would be pretty much analogous, parallel, to Islamic approaches. This is as close as critical scholarship gets to Islamic scholarship. Uh, the main difference here between the two is that this discounts the historical nature of the hadith. Now this is a very attractive way to take a look at the Islamic sources and to look into Islamic history. It's very attractive because most people who study Islamic studies are very used to the Islamic narrative. That's what they've heard, that's what they've read, that's how they were introduced to the field. And that's what most of the Muslim scholars believe and subscribe to. And so using the descriptive approach has this appeal of being able to create common ground and have a similar understanding of history along with the traditional Muslim scholars. So the descriptive approach has that advantage, and insofar as apologetics is concerned, if you're gonna be discussing Islamic history with a Muslim, this is gonna be the, the strongest platform. This is gonna be the str strongest bridge you can have, the descriptive approach. Does anyone have any questions? Is anyone completely lost? Could you, I still don't understand the difference between this, what was prior to the descriptive approach and then how that really differs. So before we had the descriptive approach, according to Fred Donner, um, people were not using the Islamic narrative at all. Mm -hmm. They were going off of extra non-Muslim sources in order to reconstruct the early history of Islam. They gave no credence whatsoever to the Akbar. And here you have the Islamic narrative, which gives you the contours of the Islamic history. Uh, and that really started in the 17th century, 18th century. Sir. Right, so the hadith are, um, and we'll do a recap for those of you who might not have been here yesterday, the hadith are the statements of Muhammad. So the things that Muhammad said, uh, often subsumed into that concept are the sunnah, or the things that Muhammad did. These statements are recorded hundreds of years after Muhammad. They were not contemporary with him. Oral tradition is what prevailed between Muhammad's time and the Hadith, and so it wasn't until about a few hundred years later that these were written down, and we'll take a look at that very briefly. So we'll be going into that a little bit more, uh, but you do need to know that at this point. The Hadith are the statements and traditions of Muhammad, recorded by Muslims approximately a few hundred years after Muhammad. Any other questions before we move on? Good, so you all have a good understanding of what we're doing, the enterprise we're engaged in right now, how to look at the sources, how to look at early Islamic studies. The descriptive approach soon gave way to a source critical approach. And for those of you who've done New Testament or biblical studies, you'll understand the source critical approach. Basically the idea here was that there are so many contradictions in the hadith, in the narratives even, in the akhbar, that they cannot be overlooked. They say something about the origins of Islamic history. And so what we ought to be able to do is take a look at these sources and try to arrange them accordingly. Which ones are earlier? Which ones are more trustworthy? Which ones give you a better picture of what actually happened? So the source critical approach would assume a few things. First, that the narrative reports are mixed with unhistorical information, though the historical kernel is still retrievable. In other words, the akhbar, the reports, are generally based off of some truth, and we can ascertain what that truth is but there's a lot of untruth mixed in there. That's one of the assumptions of the source critical approach to Islamic studies. Another assumption is that early non-Muslim sources can be used to determine the reliability of Muslim accounts. So we have well over 100 early sources on Islam that are not from Muslims. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, read uh, Hoyland's Seeing Islam as Others Saw It. He lists out all 120. Um, and he gives a good uh, understanding of what they said. Uh, generally nothing super detailed, nothing super comprehensive, little intersections of Islam with Western society is usually what most of those are. The source critical approach did, however, maintain two assumptions from the descriptive approach, which is that the Quran is virtually documentary in its use. It still tells you some st the things that happened from the seventh century in Muhammad's time, and that the Hadith are religious in nature and they are not trustworthy. 
Now, the main advantage to the source critical approach was that it understood the contradictory accounts as dogmatic or political in origin. <coughs> so it wasn't just saying there are contradictions, we can't trust it. It was saying these contradictions are derivative from, are derived from political agendas or for, for um, dogmatic reasons. So it gave a more rigorous treatment of the sources. It brought a, a fuller understanding to the picture of early Islam. The source critical approach therefore enlightened a lot, but it had one fatal flaw, which was that it assumed that the sources for Islam were written. And that was something that the tradition critical approach rectified. The tradition critical approach, which is the third approach here, understands that the sources were not written for a long, long time. The source critical approach, when you're doing source criticism, you're looking at and comparing documents and you're assuming that certain documents edited one or another or they, they, um, certain changes were made. But the tradition critical approach understood the dynamics of oral tradition uh, and took it into account. So that was one of the first uh, points of traditional, the tradition critical approach and it really did change the face of Islamic studies. It was inaugurated by Ignaz Goldzier who demonstrated that many traditions, even the sound ones from the Hadith, were actually reflections of later interests which rejected onto Muhammad. So what Goldzer did was he took a look at the Hadith that Muslims considered mutawatir, or the most sound. And these are the ones that traditionally Muslim scholars said are beyond reproach. These are the best Hadith that there are. They're the most trustworthy, the most accurate. And he would compare those and he would compare the Isnad and he would look through. Uh, don't forget the Isnad is a chain of transmission for the Hadith. He would compare them and he would show that the Isnad would actually grow over time. As traditions progressed in time, the Isnads grew further and further back to the point of Muhammad himself. And he would point out, look, these traditions are growing over time. They're not trustworthy, even the most solid ones, even the most sound ones. And by pointing this out, he was able to demonstrate that there is very little we can trust in the Hadith sources as far as the historical kernel that's there. Now he did still believe that there is historical fact to be gleaned from these Ahadith, um, but it's just extremely difficult to do. So his main contribution was that he called into question the whole corpus of Hadith literature. And he therefore rejects the documentary hypothesis of the source critical approach. In other words, you cannot really compare one source to another in order to see which one's more accurate. You have to use other means. What those means were, he didn't fully explicate. Um, and it was very difficult for uh, scholars at that point to move forward because he made such a powerful case. Now, if you're going to go into Islamic studies at all, you will encounter uh, Goldzer and you should understand his work. He, he wrote a lot and he pretty much is the origin of current Islamic studies. Now the tradition critical approach was, I'm sorry, go ahead. Is he uh, Muslim himself? No, he is German. <laughs> yeah, he is not someone that Muslims like generally. Now the tradition critical approach was so effective in raising the historical kernel of the ahadith and the akhbar that it gave way to the fourth approach which is called the skeptical approach. The skeptical approach basically says whether there is a historical kernel of truth or not in these hadith we can't know and it's kind of irrelevant because we can't extract it even if it were there. There's no real way to know the history of Islam uh, from these records. Joseph Schacht, uh, from about the 40s and 50s, um, his, law, his work on Islamic jurisprudence was probably the most effective in writing out this position. He states, even the classical corpus contains a great many traditions that cannot possibly be authentic. All efforts to extract from this often self-contradictory mass an authentic core historic intuition as it has been called, has failed. In other words, there is no way to extract historic information from the, uh, the, or from the hadith, from uh, the traditions of Muhammad. The skeptical approach has also made one 
further move away from the source critical and tradition critical approach in that they see no reason to think the Quran is actually documentary. Many of the uh, scholars from the skeptical approach have concluded the Quran is actually much later than the seventh century. John Wansborough um, is probably the most famous of the skeptical scholars here. Um, and his work, he concluded that the Quran was written three centuries after it's assumed. So he says about the ninth, 10th century is when the Quran was written. If you try to read his work, I can guarantee you it will be a headache. Um, if I were you, I would suggest reading Andrew Rippon. Andrew Rippon, he's a scholar up in Canada, and uh, he is the easiest way to understand Wandsboro. Um, but there are other scholars from this tradition, Lemens, um, who's listed first there. He's actually a Christian apologist, and because of his status as a Christian apologist, his work never took off. I don't know if you realize this, but uh, in critical studies, most people take a look at apologists and consider them biased and their work inappropriate just because they are apologists. Um, and so Lemen's work, even though most people recognize that the erudition was unbelievable and astonishing, Donner calls it astonishing. Um, he's an extremely intelligent man. Just the fact that he was pro-Christianity um, as overtly as he was and anti-Islam as overtly as he was made his work get called into question. He really did champion the criterion of embarrassment, by the way. So if you're used to uh, New Testament studies and some of the works by Mike Lacona, et cetera, Lemens was using that to, use, uh, to come up with a lot of his conclusions. Schacht, we've talked about. Patricia Crona um, is considered one of the foremost skeptical scholars. Uh, she wrote, along with Michael Cook, not David Cook from Rice, a different Cook, um, <laughs> She wrote uh, the theory for Hagarism, um, which is that Islam is basically a heterodox or a heretical Christian cult. Um, very interesting work. No one buys it, but it, uh, <laughs> it does shape Islamic studies now. This last name that I mentioned here, John Burton, I mentioned him yesterday. He is quite a character. Um, his work was very, very interesting in that he called into question very effectively the process of uh, the jurisprudence, uh, Islamic jurisprudence. Basically his position was that you had different areas in the Islamic empire where different schools of thought were vying for superiority. And so they would invent hadith to defend their positions. However, in other areas, there were people who gave more precedence to the Quran over the hadith. And so they'd invent Quranic verses that they said were then later removed. So they'd say, here was a Quranic verse, but it's been removed, but you're still supposed to follow it. Um, sorry, so Burton points out that, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. He says that's where the doctrine of abrogation originated, was people saying verses of the Quran have been abrogated, but the tradition is still to be followed. And they were using that to advance their own school of thought. Very interesting position. He concludes, uh, and in an astounding display of poor logic, he concludes that the Quran goes back to Muhammad's time, that Muhammad himself compiled the entire Quran as it's found today. He provides no positive evidence for this, he just says that there's no negative evidence against it. Um, so it's uh, an argument from silence through and through. Uh, that conclusion of his, which he tries to make the climax of his book, has been rejected by most of scholarship. But his insight into the origins of these uh, hadith, the traditions, the jurisprudence, and the growth of traditions that were contrary to one another and these abrogation issues, those insights are very profound. And if you can uh, get through his book and, and read all of that, that's uh, powerful stuff. So if you wanted to be conversant in current skeptical scholarship on Islam, uh, even critical scholarship in general, these would be the characters to read. Maybe not Lemens, but definitely the other four. JW. You mentioned um, the one other that was an easier version of Wandsboro. Could you? Andrew Rippin, R I P P I N. He even says himself he made his career off of interpreting Wandsboro. <laughs> he's in Vancouver, I believe. Um, good stuff. He's, he's written some great articles. Any other questions before moving on? So, this is a basic introduction into critical Islamic studies. Now, when it, when it comes to apologetics, which is why most of you are here, 
We have to understand what this all means. Now, we're not going to be dumping critical Islamic studies on a Muslim we encounter. But it is important to be conversant with the various approaches here. We should not be led down rabbit holes. Um, often when we talk about hadith and isnad and all that, we often get led down a track where we're kind of on faulty ground to begin with. We begin arguing uh, matan and uh, isnad and we begin arguing grading and we're basically playing on the, on the Muslim scholar's turf, which is very shaky to begin with. Um, now, we can play there. We can play on that field if we want, um, but we should do that knowingly. That should be a knowing decision that we make. Uh, we, we must be intentional about that. In actuality, the situation might be very different. Um, I myself have not concluded uh, what is stronger here. I do not think it very compelling that the Quran was written centuries after uh, it was assumed to have been written. Uh, I don't think it compelling, but I do think it brings a lot of interesting questions to light. So the description, this descriptive approach that we talked about at the beginning, it has a lot of relational utility. When you're talking to a Muslim and they really care about the Hadith, they really care about the traditions, it would be good for you to be conversant with those traditions. If someone brings up a fact, for example, um, they talk about Jesus and they say, how is it possible that Jesus could take the sin of man onto himself? Is that not unfair? Shouldn't each man suffer for himself? It is helpful to be able to point to Sahih Muslim and say, look, in Sahih Muslim, Allah says that sins can be transferred from one group to another. Um, it helps to be able to do that. Now, is Sahih Muslim accurate? Who knows? But the, the Muslim you're speaking with probably thinks it is. And so that helps build a, a bridge there. It helps give you an argument. Um, there are a lot of things like that where it'd be good to be able to uh, uh, re recount certain hadith that can build your position, especially since that's where they are right now. But it's uh, important to have these other approaches because they have scholastic utility. It gives you a better understanding of Islam. It gives you a better picture of what probably actually happened or what we, the degree of certainty w which we can have. Uh, people who stay with the descriptive approach, I've noticed, often become confused uh, as far as the level of certainty they can have. They think they really know Muhammad's life and how things happen, but you really can't know it that well given the sources. Which is a good segue to start looking at the historical Muhammad. Now that we understand scholarship, we understand the basic problems, let's take a look at Muhammad's life. We'll first start off by looking at the sources on his life. These are not comprehensive, but they are the most important that I could find. Um, we start with Sirat Rasulullah by Ibn Ishaq. Uh, now, I mentioned it yesterday. Um, somebody had a copy. Uh, I saw it floating around. Let me borrow that from you. Thanks. So as you can see, it's a, it's a fairly thick book. This is uh, a, a man by the name of Alfred Guillaume translating Ibn Ishaq. Uh, now understand, Ibn Ishaq, as we have it today, is actually a recension. It's an edited version. Ibn Ishaq wrote, he died approximately 70 AD, and then a man by the name of Ibn Hisham collected his work. Ibn Hisham goes through the work and he writes an introduction and in the introduction he says that he edited the work. He took certain parts out that he found were unbelievable um, and he left the rest. So we know that Ibn Hisham has edited this work. What we have then is a translation of a recension of Ibn Ishaq. You can buy this off Amazon and you can also find it online. I've seen whole transcripts online for free, though they are hard to find. Uh, if you want to read it to get an understanding of the earliest biography, uh, people in the class got a link to the abridged version of this work. So someone has put an abridged version online. If you get the, uh, the curriculum for this class, you'll find a link to that abridged version. I would suggest you read it. I, I think if you are interested in knowing Muhammad's life from an early Muslim perspective, you should read the book either this one or the abridged version, to get an idea of what Muslims thought about Muhammad early on. It's very, very different from what Muslims think about Muhammad today. So get a good understanding of that. That will help you in your discussions. Thank you, sir. 
So, earliest biography we have, Sirat Rasulullah Ibn Ishaq, very important. Now, what do Muslims think about Ibn Ishaq, Sirat Rasulullah? Well, they don't like it, often, especially Muslims in the West, because it says so much that it is not flattering about Muhammad. Um, it's not alone in doing that, but Western scholars, uh, well, not necessarily scholars, but Western apologists especially, have turned to Ibn Ishaq because it is the earliest biography, and they've pulled a lot out of there to show Muslims what it says, and they have reacted negatively to it. Uh, a lot of these other sources say similar things. So there might be utility in going to the other sources surely because it hasn't been rejected as much by Muslims uh, today. The second source here is fairly well respected by Muslims. It's called Muwatta Imam Malik. Um, this source is written uh, approximately, uh, Imam Malik died in 795, um, so we don't know exactly when it was written, but no later than 795. Uh, some people say it may have been as early as 770. Uh, that's still up for grabs. Another early source is al waqidis Kitab al-Maghazi. Um, al waqidi had written a lot of uh, works on Muhammad's life, but only one remains, and that's this book. And this book specifically focuses on the battles of Muhammad, the raids mostly, the early raids that happened before uh, the Battle of Badr. So reading al waqidis work will give you a very, very early insight into the ghazwat rasul the, the raids of the Prophet. Ibn Sa'd also wrote an early biography uh, of Muhammad uh, in Kitab al-Tabaqat. Very interesting stuff found there, and we're still talking about books written before the most trustworthy hadith. So these three books, apart from Sirat Rasulullah, um, are the earliest works on Muhammad, they predate the ahadith collections that we have that are considered the most authentic. Which thing? I'm sorry? Which thing? Um, well, the top four, yeah. Uh, Muwatta Imam Malik is actually a book of traditions as well, so it is a hadith book for the most part, but it deals specifically with jurisprudence. He was commissioned to write it uh, for the purpose of law recording some principles of law. And so you don't learn a lot about Muhammad's life through it, you learn more about uh, commands on, on law. Whereas the other three are books about Muhammad's life. So, just to clarify, Sirat Rasulullah, a biography, it's a Sita. Muwatta is, is a hadith, but focusing on jurisprudence. And then Kitab al-Maghazi and Kitab al-Tabakat are both books on Sita, on, on biography. After this is when you get the first book of hadith that Muslims consider trustworthy. And by Muslims, I, I mean Sunni Muslims. You get Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim. Now Sahih al-Bukhari was written by Imam Bukhari, so it's called the Sahih, the authentics, the authentic hadith, collected by Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari is reputed to have gone through hundreds of thousands of hadith. Depending on the source you read, some will say 500,000, some will say 300,000, some will say 700,000. But he went through hundreds of thousands of hadith, according to the Muslims, and he sifted through each one in order to determine how authentic and accurate it was. That process, by the way, uh, is what gave it the title Sahih. What he would do, according to Muslims, is he would travel to the person who was relaying the hadith. And so if someone is in the isnad, Right, the chain of transmission. If someone were in that chain of transmission and were still alive, he would travel to that person. And he would say, tell me the hadith as you have heard it. And the person would recite it. And he'd say, who told it to you? And he would re recount the chain of transmission from that person. If it matched, he would then say that this is authentic. He would also go through the chain of transmission and he would look at the life, the life of every person in that chain. And he would see, was this person a truthful person? Was he an honest person? Or did he have a reputation for scheming and lying? If he had a bad reputation, he would discredit the hadith, he wouldn't include it. It is said that he went so far uh, in determining whether someone was accurate uh, in their recounting of the hadith, that if he would go to a person to learn about a hadith, and he saw that person mistreating an animal, he would immediately discredit that person <coughs> and say that this hadith is not trustworthy because it's coming from an untrustworthy person. Here's a person who doesn't take care of animals. How, how do we know he would take care of something like a hadith? So Imam Bukhari, extremely well respected among Sunnis. Uh, to put it colloquially, is if it's in Sahih Bukhari, most Muslims consider it good as gold. Now Imam Bukhari had a student named Imam Muslim. 
Imam Muslim produced Sahih al-Muslim. And so Sahih al-Muslim is considered by Muslims to be the next most trustworthy book of Hadith. Now we can't, historically speaking, we can't say this is independent of Bukhari because we know it's his student. Uh, he was learning directly from Bukhari, so most of what you find in Muslim, uh, if it's also in Bukhari, we can know came from Bukhari. However, Muslims don't see it that way. And if they see, it, if they see a hadith in both, both Muslim and Bukhari, they think it is as strong as any hadith could possibly be. Not Muslim scholars per se, but uh, most, the, the lay Muslim sees it that way. Uh, Imam Muslim didn't uh, live long after Imam Bukhari. He died about five years later. But you can find all of Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari exists in nine volumes. You can find it all on sahihbukhari.com. Um, again, there's no, there's no isnad there, just the matan. And you can find all of Sahih al-Muslim as well. Um, you will find that there are different numbering systems used online. People are trying to codify the numbering systems. And now, mostly what people I've seen are using, for, it, for Sahih al-Bukhari, they're using volume, book, and hadith number. So you'll see three numbers for Sahih al-Bukhari. The first number is for volume, the second is for book, the third is for hadith number. Um, you might still find the old numbering, which is just a number, and you'll find it in the thousands. Um, but they're, they're trying to change that. Sahih al-Muslim is by book and by number. So you'll, you'll see two numbers there usually. Uh, to end the story, Imam Bukhari took these five, seven, three hundred thousand hadith and whittled them down to five hundred, I'm sorry, five thousand. Um, so according to most Muslims, they would agree that Imam Bukhari threw out about 99% of the hadith he came across. Very interesting. Yep. Um, what's an imam? So that's a good question. Um, an imam is a, uh, basically a leader. Um, you don't have the same clerical status that you had in, uh, in Catholic Christianity at the time. Um, people weren't ordained per se. If you were learned uh, and you stood out amongst the Muslims around you, you'd easily be called an imam. Now, if you did go through some rigorous training, you could gain other titles, like sheikh, um, but an imam is pretty much a learned person. That's not to say that Bukhari was not extremely learned. He was. Um, but the title itself does not imply necess necessarily a lot of learning. It just implies that he's considered a leader amongst the community. Good question. In the back. Uh, this seems to be based, especially on the deeds, on a lot of human judgment. The Imam, um, I mean, Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim comes close. Um, they wouldn't say it's divinely inspired, but they would say that these Imams collected Muhammad's work very, or Muhammad's words and actions very accurately, and Muhammad's words and actions were essentially inspired. So in that sense, indirectly, yeah, most Sunni Muslims would consider Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim as good as gold. But they, no, I don't know a single Muslim who'd say they're divinely inspired. Uh, isn't it necessary to contrast the level of inspiration uh, if a hadith isn't divinely inspired, why wouldn't it be Quran? Right, so that's why I, I'm pointing out that no one would say it's divinely inspired. Um, but they would say that if it accurately reflects what Muhammad said and did, Muhammad's actions and sayings are so close to divinely inspired that we can trust what they say. Um, now that's not to say that there are some hadith that Muslims think are divinely inspired. Um, there's a few hadith that, Muh that Muslims consider that came directly from Allah to Muhammad um, as divine revelation that was not supposed to be included in the Quran. Um, those hadith are called hadith qudsi, Q-U-D-S-I, hadith qudsi. Um, that's very interesting. We're going to talk about that briefly uh, as, we, as we get into the Quran. Uh, so there are some hadith that Muslims consider divinely inspired, uh, but the vast majority of these, no. They, the question is, did they come from Muhammad or not? And if they did, they are almost as good as that. Hey, David, could you do me a favor? So when people ask questions, I don't think it gets into the recording. Okay. So if I forget to restate the question for the recording, let me know. You got it? All right. <laughs> JW. Um, 
You said that essentially Hikari, or I'm not sure I'm saying that right, um, threw out the other ones. Does that mean like they were a lot of them were written down and he kind of like burned them like the other versions of the grant? No. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so the question was, did Bukhari write them down and, and throw them out, or did he burn other people's um, writings of these hadith? And that's not what happened. Uh, he would go and he would, um, he would basically see whether or not he should include it in his work. Now, you do have certain people who record hadith who say that their purpose was just to record the hadith. They didn't care how accurate it was, they were just recording everything. Um, and in contrast to that, you have someone like Bukhari who said, I wanted to make sure this came from Muhammad's lips. So that is important to Muslims. Um, was it vetted for accuracy? But the vast majority of these, I think, and I, I, can't, I can't be certain, there's a, a degree of speculation here, but the vast majority of hadith, I haven't included anything past Sunan Abu Dawood, but I think uh, a lot of these books, they were trying to record accurate hadith. They weren't just trying to record everything. Um, now, it would be unfair to anachronistically think that they had, in that time, quite the same level of understanding we did of historical specificity. They didn't. Um, that's why you, you understand the oral chain of transmission really mattered to them. Because it wasn't written, they had to go to a trustworthy person, and they had to get that from a trustworthy person, so it really did matter to them. They had a different understanding of uh, historical accuracy. It was much more oral than ours. Oh, there's no question. We've lost a lot. Um, whether, uh, have we lost, thank you. <laughs> have we lost the other hadith that were out there? Um, and yeah, we've probably lost a lot, but the question is, were those of any value or not? Um, it, they would definitely be helpful to understand the hadith that were circulating at that time. What was the, the mindset of Muslims at that time? They would be helpful for that purpose. But for our purposes, which is Muhammad, um, we're not as interested in later Islam, where we as you know, looking into this from an apologetic lens, are more interested in Muhammad. I don't know if the ones that we've lost mattered at all. Uh, a lot of the other works, though, that we see here record those hadith. So it's not like Imam Bukhari has the most and everyone else just has what he has. A lot of the other hadith are found in these other works. You will find that many Muslims don't trust anything but say Bukhari and say Muslim. They just think that the rest is completely untrustworthy and these two are the only trustworthy ones. So they have a very black and white approach. Um, that's just the, the result of being a lay Muslim who hasn't looked into these things. Most scholars quote from all kinds of sources. I saw another hand. Okay. Now the next one on the list is Sunan Abu Dawud. Uh, if you recall from yesterday, uh, a sahih is considered um, something that's been vetted for accuracy. A Sunan collection is a collection that focuses specifically on the actions of Muhammad. Not so much his saying, but his actions, what he did. Uh, so the Sunan, that doesn't go to say though that it's not focused on accuracy. Um, Abu Dawud is considered a very accurate collection among Sunni Muslims as well. In fact, there is a, a collection of books um, called the Siha Sitta, uh, the six Sahih works. And uh, these three are the top three among them, Bukhari, Muslim, and Sunan Abu Dawud. So Sunni Muslims pretty much officially recognize these three books to be the most accurate. They give a lot more weight to the first two and they give the most weight to Bukhari. Which three are they there? Bukhari, Muslim, and Abu Dawud. Sunan Abu Dawud. <coughs> One last one I included here was uh, the Tariqh of Tabari. It's very interesting. Uh, I think Tabari was a cool guy. Uh, what he did was he sat down and he wrote a history of the world. Um, so nine volumes starting from the creation of the world uh, up until his day. So it goes straight till 915 AD. Um, and part of that is Muhammad's life. So you've got uh, not just Muhammad's life, but everything according to Tabari in, this, in his works. Uh, and his works are generally well respected, um, even though it's much later than the rest. Uh, his works are generally well respected amongst Muslims. Uh, not nearly as well respected as the books of Hadith, but still well respected. Far more well respected than Ibn Ishaq I've seen. 
So these are the sources we're working with. Uh, this is, as far as dating is concerned, this is what we've got. This is as early as it gets uh, and as trustworthy as it gets from Muslim eyes. And so you have to kind of take your pick. How are you going to approach this? Are you going to approach this from a Muslim perspective? If you are, you'll be focusing on Bukhari, Muslim, and Abu Daud. Are you going to look at it from a historical perspective? If you are, you're probably going to focus on Sirat Rasulullah and perhaps the Muwatta and Kitab al Maghazi. Um, it's important to know what you're using and why you're using it and how Muslims see it if you're going to be doing this for an apologetic purpose. Any questions? You said the top three are historical and the, and the, the three S's are what? Okay. So. The one up top yeah. is the earliest biography, which is what Sira means. The second one, Muwatta, that is a collection of hadith, but specifically focused on jurisprudence. These two, Kitab al Maghazi and the Tabakat, those are both Siras as well. They're both biographies. These three are focused on uh, hadith. These are all collections of Muhammad's sayings and actions, especially Sunan Abu Dawud, that's mostly actions. This is considered the most trustworthy amongst Muslims. This is considered the next most trustworthy. But we should keep in mind that Imam Muslim was Imam Bukhari's student. So this is derivative of this. Uh, and this last one is the history of the world by Tabari. Ooh, other questions? I saw. Yeah. Is there any reason other than just on the content why they throw out Ibn Shah? Because I've heard that a lot where they're like, they just discredit it. Even in like some of the debates people. The reason that they'll give, oh yeah, thanks. Um, the reason, or the question was, is there a reason why Ibn Ishaq is thrown out by a lot of Muslims? And the reason why is because they often just juxtapose it with Bukhari, where Bukhari did go through and specifically said, I am going to make sure everything we have in here is accurate and authentic. Ibn Ishaq didn't say that, per se. And they'll often impugn the work by saying that he was including everything. I don't think that's accurate. I think he was trying to include an accurate picture. Um, but the main reason I have seen, and, th and the way I've seen it is this, Often when talking to Muslims, I'll say, here's Ibn Ishaq, it's the earliest Sira. Do you think it would be accurate? Yeah, sure, why not? It's the earliest Sira, it's written by a Muslim, makes sense. Then they read it, and then they come back and they say, no, it's not accurate. And, and that, to me, the reason why is because it conflicts with their understanding of Muhammad's life. Where does their understanding of Muhammad's life come from? Modern biographies, their imams, their parents. Um, so, yeah, it's anecdotal. Uh, don't take that for, um, for apodictic. But I think the reason why is because they don't like what it says. Any other questions? Okay, so what we've done is we've taken a look at the, the historical approaches, I'm sorry, the approaches to the historical studies of early Islam. And we've now looked at the sources on Muhammad's life as well as the history of early Islam. That brings us to a point where we have to ask ourselves, how do we go about this? What, what do we learn? What, how do we move forward from here? And what I want to point out before we move forward is that the historical studies by people like Schacht, like Goldzer, have shown that the Hadith are extremely problematic. They contradict each other. They come from agendas. They come from purposes. People in specific schools have their own agendas for writing certain Hadith and fabricating them. Um, and we really cannot get to a historical kernel of truth if we rigorously analyze the sources, it's very difficult. Um, what we would have to do is something more like a general understanding. Look, people generally conceded this, and people generally conceded that. Therefore, it's quite likely that this is true. But even that kind of conclusion is relatively problematic. We can only have so much certainty about Muhammad's life. But if we are going to engage with Muslims, on Muhammad and on his life, then we have to look at the testimony of the Sita. We have to look at the testimony of the Hadith and see what it says. So at this point, we're going to kind of break, not, not temporarily, we're, we're going to break um, what we've just looked at. We have basically concluded we don't know how trustworthy any of this is. That's what we've realized. But we're going to move forward for a little while and say, let's just assume it is trustworthy. What do they say? OK? Everyone understand? So we're moving forward saying, OK, let's just say this stuff is trustworthy. What do they say? So what is the testimony of Hadith and Sirah? Now, we've talked about some of this yesterday. We're going to go back over it now. 
The testimony of Hadith and Sirah regarding Muhammad's life is that he was orphaned soon after his birth. Um, and we know that, again, uh, his father died before he was born, his mother died shortly thereafter when he was six, his grandfather died when he was eight, and he was given over to the possession of his uncle. Um, I'm going fast because we talked about this yesterday. He was born during a time of war between the Romans and the Persians, and that colors some of the ayat in the Quran. I'm sorry, the word ayat means verses. Um, so if you hear the word ayah, that means a verse of the Quran. Specifically, the word means signs, by the way. Um, so each verse of the Quran is meant as a sign for people. Um, anyhow, a lot of the ayat of the Quran are colored by the war um, between the Romans and the Persians. Muhammad was considered al-Amin or al-Siddiq, the trustworthy. He was considered to be an upstanding citizen amongst the pagans in Mecca up until the time of his prophethood. Um, this is what the Sira and the Hadith say. During this time, uh, he was a merchant in his early years. He traveled a lot, he sold, he traded. Uh, he developed an understanding of commerce. And we see that reflected, very, very detailed reflections on commerce and on, on trade in the Quran, in the Hadith. So the Hadith and the Sira con uh, corroborate this, that Muhammad actually had uh, a lot of experience with trade and with commerce. At the time, uh, when he was 25 years old, he was working as a merchant, there was a rich widow in the city. Her name was Khadija. She was 40 years old when he was 25. And she offered uh, herself in marriage to him. And Muhammad said yes, and he married Khadija. So his first wife was 15 years his elder, and she was, uh, she was a wealthy widow who, according to the Islamic sources, who respected the way Muhammad treated the, his goods. In other words, Muhammad was a good steward over the goods he was selling, and so she respected that, and she wanted to marry him, and she offered herself in marriage, and he, he accepted. We'll skip the night of power for now. Had she been previous been married? Khadija, yes, she was a widow. Yeah. Uh, so she, he asked, uh, had she been previously married? And yes, she was a widow. I don't know the answer to that. I've read four. You've read four? She's not a gold digger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the first for me. Um, I have never looked into that. Good, that's a good question. Okay, thanks. So um, here's the testimony of the Hadith. During Muhammad's preaching in Mecca, we remember the first three years was the Fatrat e Wahi. He did not preach the first three years. So from 610 to 613 AD, Muhammad did not preach publicly. He just preached to family and friends. After that, he started preaching publicly, and it's said that there was persecution, um, the persecution of Muhammad and his people. You'll remember during his public ministry, Muhammad um, had approximately 40 um, followers convert. I don't know how accurate that number is. That's just a number from one source. I've counted um, other sources which will say up to 100, but it's not you know, an order of 10 or something uh, 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 disparate. It's you know, about that much, somewhere around 100 um, people followed him during his public ministry in Mecca. At this time, the persecutions that were happening are interesting. There were martyrs. How many martyrs were there? Uh, it's hard to tell. Probably around three or four. Um, how many people were persecuted in toto? Probably around 15, as far as physical persecution. What happened to Muhammad in this time? Well, at one point, a man by the name of Uqba grabbed Muhammad, and he kind of shook him and kind of squeezed his throat. He throttled him, is what it says. Uh, that was one thing that happened to Muhammad. Another thing that happened to Muhammad was while he was praying, apparently people came and they put intestines, camel intestines on him. Um, so that he couldn't get up while he was praying. That about sums up the physical persecution that Muhammad faced. Uh, you will see a lot of Muslims uh, playing that up. They'll say, man, Muhammad was under all kinds of physical persecution and they were horrible and they tortured and blah. Not really, Th that was about it. Um, there was another time when he went to Taif um, where it said that the people there persecuted him as well, uh, but they weren't Meccans. We're talking about the Meccan persecution here. It wasn't that much when you look at the sources, but often, especially in polemics, you'll see that played up. There were martyrs, though. There were martyrs, but the people who were martyred 
uh, were not Muhammad, they weren't protected like Muhammad was. Muhammad, remember from yesterday, his uncle was in charge of his family and he had placed protection over Muhammad. Uh, so Muhammad was protected until his uncle's death. So during this time of persecution, Muhammad started to look for other places to live. That's why he went to Taif. Uh, but he ultimately ended up going to Yathrib, which became Medina, according to the sources. Uh, and as we mentioned yesterday, that's when he became a lawgiver and judge over Medina. This is when the battle started happening. Less than a year into Muhammad's stay there, he started launching raids against caravans. Again, you can read that um, in the book Kitab al-Maghazi by al-Waqidi. You can find that in works by uh, Ibn Kathir, for example, in Ghazwat e Rasul, that's available online. It's called Battles of the Prophet. Battles of the Prophet, that's for free online. Very insightful stuff. Um, and of course, you can read these from Ibn Ishaq as well. All kinds of sources you can read about this. Essentially, what Muhammad started doing, according to the sources, was he started launching raids on caravans. Um, the most egregious raid was the Nakhla raid. Now the Nakhla raid, N-A-K-H-L-A, Nakhla raid. The Nakhla raid was very interesting because what Muhammad did was he sent a group of, uh, of Muslims out into a point in the desert. He said, go out to this place and when you get there, open up this letter. So they didn't even know what they were going out there for. Uh, they were told to go and they had this letter. When they opened the letter, it said that they were to engage a certain caravan that was going to pass through the area. Well, it turns out that that time was the holy month. And there was basically a ceasefire during that time. No one was able to fight. No one was allowed to fight. This was understood amongst Arabs. No one should fight during this time. It would be, um, it would be blasphemous, essentially, to fight during that time. Yet Muhammad has sent his soldiers out there with this letter. Uh, so they weren't able to ask him. Uh, they weren't able to question it by the time they got out there. They were already out there. And so when the caravan came by, um, they dressed up, uh, I believe, they dressed up as pilgrims. Um, and they get, came close to the caravan. And then the caravan was, the caravan was lightly defended because it was the holy month. Um, and it was a massive caravan, lots of goods. And they attacked that caravan, they plundered, they killed. And they, they took the stuff back to Medina. So that was the most egregious of the raids. It was after that point that we see the Meccans sending large groups to defend their caravans. Um, and the next caravan that came that Muhammad tried to attack was well defended. And that's what led to the Battle of Badr. Uh, if, you're, if you're gonna ask for any of the sources on this, again, those same books that I mentioned earlier, go to Kitab al-Maghazi, go to Sirat Rasulullah, go to Ghazwat e Rasul, you will find this information in those books. So the first major battle amongst Muslims occurred on account of the Nakhla raid. Uh, this is found in the Islamic sources. Now, Muslims, lay Muslims today don't know that. Here's how they see it. They see it as uh, the Meccans were furious at Muhammad. They wanted to kill him. Um, and so when he went to Medina, they still wanted to kill him. So they came out and tried to attack the Medinans. How that doesn't really bear out in scrutiny of the sources because the Medinans just wanted to get rid of Muhammad. That's all they really wanted. And when Muhammad was gone, it doesn't make sense that they would chase him. They had no purpose in chasing him. They had all its stuff. He was gone. He wasn't causing problems anymore. In fact, according to the sources, we read in Sirat Rasulullah that Muhammad was the one who first threatened slaughter for the Meccans. Um, so the Islamic sources here, when we look at the Sita, when we look at Hadith, uh, is, is very uh, difficult for Islamic polemics. We see that Muhammad was the one who is really perpetrating some of the hostilities here. After the Battle of Badr, you had the Battle of Uhud. Uh, again, this was the battle that was uh, lost by the Muslims. Here, Muhammad uh, was physically injured. Uh, I believe he lost some of his teeth in this battle. Some of his uh, close companions were killed in this battle. Um, it, it's one that Muslims are not proud of. Essentially what happened, according to the Islamic sources, what happened was midway through the battle, some Muslims left their post. Um, there was a, a hill that they were defending and the Muslims who were guarding that hill left the post. Uh, some Muslims say that they left because they thought the battle was over. Other sources don't indicate that. Regardless, one way or another, we see that the Muslims left their post and the opposing general saw the opening, he attacked through there, he basically flanked the Muslims and chaos broke loose. 
Uh, it wasn't until the Meccans thought Muhammad was dead. He had been injured, he had been knocked out. Um, they thought he was dead. That's when the battle ended. Turned out he wasn't dead. But as you can see, that was a difficult battle for the Muslims. Then came the Battle of the Trench. Uh, by this time, uh, within a matter of a few years, two of the three Jewish tribes from, uh, from Medina have been exiled. Um, the first tribe was exiled, uh, then the second. They weren't exiled together. And here, the Battle of the Trench was what led to the third exile. Uh, I'm sorry, the third tribe being executed. And we'll talk about that shortly. After that, we have the conquest of Mecca. We talked about that yesterday. So this is the history of Muhammad's life according to the Hadith and the Sirah. There's a lot more details, a lot, but we really can't get into that today if we want to cover some of the other issues at hand. Yes? You said yesterday that um, one of the guaranteed ways into heaven was if you died in, one, in a battle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, the question was, uh, yesterday I'd said that there were certain ways to be a guaranteed admission into heaven, um, and one of those is having taken place in the Battle of Badr, so the first battle. Um, also dying in any battle, dying in any jihad, uh, is considered a way to be sure to get into heaven. So anyone who died in any of these battles, according to Muslims, they went to heaven. Sir? Did you mean to say something about the night of power on the, on the second to last stage? I decided against it. Okay. I don't need to repeat that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not recalling what the Sira is. Sira means biography. Okay. So Sira Rasulullah from Ibn Ishaq, that means biography of the Messenger of Allah. And Rasul is uh, a title for all prophets, but usually when they say Rasul Allah, they generally mean Muhammad. I saw another question. Okay. So the sources here, when we talk about Muhammad's life then, they, they give us insight into a lot. Now there are many positive things here in Muhammad's life. For example, he would cause uh, a lot of the, he would get a lot of the zakat to go to orphans and to widows. Uh, again, this, these are the mandatory alms that Muslims had to pay. He would give a lot of that to the orphans and to the widows and to the wayfarers. And so there was some good there. We had the conquest of Mecca where we had a lot of mercy shown. So there was some good there as well. Um, but there's also a lot of bad stuff here. And some stuff that's ugly. So uh, <laughs> we're going to take a look at the good, the bad, and the ugly here. <laughs> so Muhammad was dedicated to social reform um, to certain extents. Uh, it was a common practice in Arabia to kill children as soon as they were born, usually girls. Um, but also boys. Some of that could have been for ritual purposes. We can't say for sure. But there was definitely some economic incentive there. It was difficult to raise daughters in those times. There would be a burden on the fathers. And so sometimes poor fathers, instead of taking care of their daughters, would have, uh, I guess you could call them post-birth abortions. Um, they would kill their daughters after they were born. They'd bury them in the sand. Muhammad came and he ended that practice. So uh, a good thing for him to do. Now, Muslims will often say that this is uh, female infanticide. It actually happened with boys, too. Yeah. So he ended it for women and for men, or boys and girls. Also, as I said, he helped widows and orphans. This is probably because he was passed around as an orphan when he was young, and he probably saw firsthand the injustices uh, that were perpetrated against orphans. Um, whether that was the reason or not, it was a good thing that he started helping orphans out after that point, uh, as well as widows. He was able to secure them certain rights that they didn't have. You will often hear statements like, Muhammad was a champion for women's rights. Um, he, he gave women rights when they had none. Uh, that is an exaggeration. There were a lot of rights accorded to women around Arabia uh, that were actually taken away when the Islamic Empire took over. For example, there were some places in Arabia where women were uh, basically the, the matriarchs of families, they were the ones in charge. There were certain parts of Arabia where uh, lineage was traced in a matrilinear form. So a mother's child, uh, you were considered your mother's child, and that mother's child, etc. It would go up through the women. 
Certain places allow divorce uh, by women a lot more easily than in Islam. In Islam, if you're going to be divorced as a woman, you have to get a fatwa. You have to get a judgment from someone saying you can be divorced. A man can divorce his wife just by saying the word talaq three times, which means divorce. So if you say talaq, 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 you have divorced your wife. A woman can't do that. She has to go to a jurist. Um, whether that traces back to Muhammad's time, I'm not sure. Uh, but what we can know is that Muhammad did not allow women to divorce men as easily as they were able before Islam. Before Islam, certain parts of Arabian society, all a woman had to do to divorce her husband was while he was at work, out in the field, she could pick up her tent and turn it around. Not a good welcome home sign. Um, but the man would be forced to leave at that point and not just leave there, he'd have to leave the whole tribe and guess what, he didn't get any of his belongings, he didn't get any of his kids. Um, so uh, can we say uh, categorically that Islam gave women rights they did not have? No, we can't say that. Did they give some women rights they didn't have? Sure, sure. And were some rights accorded that didn't exist before that? Yeah. Um, but can we say categorically that it was, no, and in fact, it's a distortion probably to say that he accorded more rights. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case. By the way, all that information was uh, attained from Hoyland's uh, Arabia and the Arabs. Sir. Just answer my question. Okay. Yes. Doesn't uh, the existence of Khadija as a wealthy widow that had her own thrive, I mean, that shows that prior to Islam, Exactly. Even, even in Mecca itself, there were women who had uh, finances. Um, yeah, the, the extent of the claims by Muslim polemicists often differ. Um, what exactly was allowed, what wasn't. Um, some might argue that she wasn't able to pass on that money as she wanted to um, until Muhammad came. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate that is. Uh, so. What we can know, though, is that there were some societies in Arabia which, after Muhammad, were taken over by Muslims where those women had less rights than they had before. That said, he did accord certain rights to women and to orphans, and he codified them through the Quran. So in doing that, he did make sure that women had some rights and some privileges. They were also given weight of testimony. Uh, before Islam, it's, it's not uniform in Arabia how women's testimony was received. After uh, Islam, women's testimony was worth something. Um, it was worth half that of a man, but it was still worth something. Um, and even to this day, it's worth half that of a man. If, uh, if a man sees a crime happen and a woman sees it, the woman's testimony, if she differs from the man, won't overturn the man's testimony. You have to have two. Um, and it's told why in the Islamic sources. Uh, women are said to have half the intellect of men. And so if uh, one woman forgets, the other woman will remember, and that will be worth the testimony of one man. Regardless, they did get testimony. And so there were some good things here. Uh, another good thing is that Muhammad ended polytheism. That is good. I think uh, a priori, you know, monotheism is better than polytheism. So he ended polytheism. Uh, and Muhammad was certainly courageous, that moral character of courage he portrayed. According to the sources, uh, he would not back down. Uh, one of the sources said that the Meccan chiefs, before he went to Medina, the Meccan chiefs came up to him and said, what will it take for you to stop preaching Islam? And Muhammad's response was, I don't care if you gave me the sun and the moon, I'm going to preach this one God. That's courageous. You know, that's bold. So that's a good thing. And sometimes we know, such as at the conquest of Mecca, he showed great mercy. So there is good here. And if we paint Muhammad as entirely demonic or a totally evil man, uh, we are not only uh, probably going to lose the people we're trying to witness to, we're also losing the, the backing of history, if we consider the Hadith and Sirah to be trustworthy. But we have the bad as well to balance that out with. Are, are you guys doing all right? Did you need a break? You're good? All right, we'll keep going for a little bit more. There were assassinations that Muhammad ordered, and not just a few. There were quite a few uh, assassinations that Muhammad ordered, and some of these are more egregious than others. Uh, the, the assassination of Abu Afaq and Asma, uh, we can read from Ibn Ishaq. Sorry for 
the busyness of the slide, but here we go. Abu Afaq was one of the Ubaidah clan. He showed his disaffection when the apostle killed Al-Harith and said, so here's Abu Afaq, here's what he says when uh, Muhammad killed uh, somebody he knew. Afaq said, long have I lived, but never have I seen an assembly or collection of people more faithful to their undertaking and their allies when called upon than the sons of Qayla when they assembled, men who overthrew mountains and never submitted. So he's basically writing uh, a eulogy. A writer who came to them split them in two, saying permitted, forbidden of all sorts of things. He's talking about Muhammad there. Had you believed in glory or kingship, you would have followed Duba. So basically he says to Muhammad, uh, or to whoever's reading this, had you believed in glory or kingship, you would have followed somebody else. Um, and he's lamenting the death of these folk. Muhammad hears this and his response is, who will deal with this rascal for me? Whereupon Salim bin Umar, brother of uh, that guy, um, went forth and killed him. So Muhammad ordered the assassination of a man who all he did was lamented uh, the death of someone he knew. Now interestingly, a woman by the name of Asma bint Marwan lamented the death of Abu Afaq. She lamented the death of this man. And she wrote a poem. And when Muhammad heard that poem, he said, who will rid me of Marwan's daughter? Omer, who was with him, heard him. And that very night, he went to her house and killed her. In the morning, he came to the apostle and told him what he had done. And Muhammad said, you have helped God and his apostle, O Omer. When he asked if he would have to bear any evil consequences, the apostle said, two goats won't butt their heads about her. So Omer went back to his people. In other words, Muhammad says, it doesn't matter that you killed her. Nothing cares about her. No one cares about her. And the reason why we've learned from other stories, the reason why Omer was so worried was because she was a mother of five children um, and he killed her. So he was dealing with some psychological difficulty there and Muhammad gave him a little bit of comfort by saying no one cares about her. We also find one in Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, this is about Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf. Allah's apostle said, who is willing to kill Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf who, who has hurt Allah and his apostle? Thereupon Muhammad bin Maslama said, O oh, Allah's apostle, would you like that I kill him? The prophet said, yes. Muhammad bin Maslama said, then allow me to lie in order to deceive Ka'ab. The prophet said, you may. The story is very interesting. At this point, um, this other Muhammad goes to Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf's house and he basically pretends to get a loan from him. Um, and as his, uh, as his deposit for the loan, he says he'll bring some weaponry, um, some, ar uh, some of his armory as a deposit. And uh, Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf agrees. The next day, he comes back with his weapons and instead of using them as a deposit, he uses them to kill him. So that, that was what the lie was and Muhammad allowed it in order for the assassination. This is not good when it comes to understanding who Muhammad was. There's a lot more. There are a lot more of these. For example, in this list, we have Kinana. Kinana was the treasurer of Khaybar. Um, he was the one who was in charge of the money there. And when they overtook Khaybar, Khaybar was a uh, city of Jews that lived north of, um, of Medina. And one of the exiled tribes of Medina partially went there to continue living. Um, Kinana was the treasurer there. When they overtook the city, uh, and by the way, the men uh, at the time were not armed. They were just farming in their fields when the Muslims came and attacked and killed up to 90 people from that city. Um, Kanana was a treasurer and he was given over um, to torture. They asked him where the money was and he would not say. And so what they did was they lit a fire on his chest. Um, they, they kindled a fire right there on his chest and they tortured him to try to get him to, to tell them where the money was. And they did not say, or he did not say, and so then they beheaded him. So that's the story of Kinana. And there's many of these stories here. When it comes to Muhammad's life then, um, assassinations are problematic. Uh, we get this from the Sira and this last one about Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf. That was in Sahih Bukhari. So Muslims will often throw out the story of Asma bin Marwan and of Abu Afaq, but they can't do that with uh, Ka'ab bin al-Ashraf because it's in Bukhari. So they'll try to find ways around it. 
I talked briefly about the Jews as well. This is another point of difficulty about Muhammad's life. After Muhammad had expelled the two tribes of Jews, we were left with uh, Banu Kainuka. I'm sorry, uh, Banu Koreza, the Koreza Jews um, in Medina. These were the last, this was the last tribe that was there and they have seen Muhammad exile one tribe after another of Jews. They know they're next um, and they're worried. And so when the Medinans come, I'm sorry, when the Meccans come to try to fight Medina at the Battle of the Trench, they ally themselves with the Meccans. When uh, the Muslims did not lose the battle, when it came to a stalemate, the Jews then had to pay for their uh, betrayal, as Muhammad put it. There is a possible reference to this event in the Quran, chapter 33, verse 26, uh, when it says that some of these were given over to slaughter. Well, some of these Jews who had betrayed had been given over to slaughter. Uh, so there's a reference to this event in the Quran, potentially. We know from Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4390, that the men were all killed, and it was told very explicitly how. Um, if you were a man who had clearly reached puberty, you were beheaded. If it was unclear whether you'd reached puberty, so if you're a 12, 13, 14 year old boy, 11 year old boy, somewhere in there, they would have you, have you drop your pants. And uh, if it was determined that you had reached a stage of maturity, uh, then they would behead you. And this report is given by a boy who was at that time forced to, uh, to show whether or not he had reached maturity and he had not, so he survived. That story is accounted for in Sunan Abu Dawood. The women and children were taken into slavery at that point. Again, that's Sunan Abu Dawood, 2665. One woman, uh, when she had seen the slaughter of her family, went into hysterics. She had, went under uncontrollable laughter. She, she was unable to control herself. Um, and she's watching people being beheaded and she's laughing, she can't help but laugh. And it annoyed the people enough, annoyed the Muslims enough, annoyed Muhammad enough to order her to be beheaded as well. So we know at this time that one woman was beheaded. This story is recounted through Aisha in Sunan Abu Dawood. So Aisha at this time is about 12 years old and she's watching all these people get beheaded. She's watching this woman go into hysterics. She doesn't quite understand what was going on at the time. So when you see the Hadith, uh, she's, she's not very compassionate. Um, and it's probably because she didn't quite understand what was going on. Soon thereafter, a lot of the women, uh, the property was confiscated and a lot of the women uh, were sold in the slave market, in a distant slave market. Um, there wasn't much property. These people were mostly farmers. Um, and so trading them in the slave market was uh, a lot better for any sort of martial expeditions. Any questions? Let's talk about the ugly briefly. We mentioned yesterday how Muhammad was married to a six-year-old girl, again, Aisha. Um, it was said that she was betrothed to Muhammad, that Muhammad asked for her hand in marriage when she was six. So he's 49, she's six. He goes to his best friend, uh, whose daughter was Aisha. His, uh, his best friend was Abu Bakr. Uh, you'll remember that name because he was the first caliph of Islam after Muhammad died, so he was the successor. But he wasn't at this point. Muhammad goes up to Abu Bakr and he says, uh, Allah has, has shown me that I should marry your daughter. And Abu Bakr basically says, how can you do that? Um, he, he shows some hesitance. He's like, how can you marry her? And he doesn't cite her age. He says, you and I are like brothers. And the Quran says, you can't marry your brother's daughter. Um, and Muhammad says, well, we're not blood brothers. And so I can marry your daughter. So Abu Bakr initially so showed some hesitation. Uh, but Muhammad pressed on and he was able to marry Aisha at the age of six. Uh, now, that doesn't mean she went into his home at that time. Um, he, she, in our Western conception, it'd probably be better, better to say that she was betrothed to him at that point. She didn't enter his home until the age of nine. Now, uh, Imam Bukhari tells us that she was at that time still uh, playing with dolls, uh, which others have said is a sign of the fact that she had not reached puberty. Um, she was not yet mature in the sight of the society around her. So when she was nine years old, taken into Muhammad's home for uh, the purpose of consummation, she had not yet reached puberty according to some sources. Again, how accurate is all this? Who knows? But this is in the sources. Uh, I have listed Sahih Muslim 3309 here, there are a ton. There are a ton of sources on this. Um, if you want to see them all, 
We did a quick video on this issue by we, I mean my friend David and I. By the way, I didn't tell you this yesterday. Uh, at, at the end, after uh, my friend David helped lead me to the Lord, he and I joined a ministry together. Um, we call it Acts 17 Apologetics. So up until last year, I was a part of that ministry. He and I did a lot together. One of the things we did together was a video on this issue. We went to the Islamic Society of North America's National Conference in 2009. And uh, we wanted to see the kinds of stuff they were teaching. We recorded some sessions. We looked at some of their pamphlets and whatnot. And if you go to YouTube and you type in ISNA, I-S-N-A, uh, Child Bride, uh, you'll have a whole video on this issue. Uh, of course, a lot of these issues are you can find online, but you'll find a lot more of the sources written there in case you're interested. One of the other ugly issues that we talked about yesterday was the treatment of female captives. Um, the Quran declares that it is appropriate to have sexual intercourse with female prisoners. I gave you the verse number 424 for that. There are other verses as well. And Hadith clarify it. So let's look at one of those verses, Surah 23, 1 through 6. The believers must win through those who humble themselves in their prayers. Uh, this is basically giving characteristics of believers, of Muslims. Those who humble themselves in, in their prayers, those who avoid vain talk, who are active in deeds of charity, who abstain from sex, except with those joined to them in the marriage bond or the captives whom their right hands possess. For in their case, they are free from blame. In other words, this verse is saying you can engage in sexual intercourse with your four wives or any number of your female captives. Surah 70, verses 22 through 30 say something similar, giving a list of characteristics of good Muslims. Those who remain steadfast to their prayer, those in whose wealth is recognized right for the needy, in other words, they give of their wealth to the poor. Those who hold to the truth of the day of judgment. So, I mean, here you can see a lot of cool stuff. They pray a lot, they give to the needy. They're, they're remembering the day of judgment um, and they fear the displeasure of their Lord. But then you get this part those who guard their chastity, except with their wives and those captives whom their right hands possess. Now the word captives is in parenthesis because there is no Arabic parallel to that, but this is basically giving you the explanation that we find from Hadith. And here's an example from Sahih Bukhari, book 34, number 432. While he was sitting with Allah's apostle, he said, O oh Allah's apostle, we get female captives as our share of booty and we are interested in their prices. What is your opinion about coitus interruptus? In other words, we want to sell these women, um, but we don't want to get them pregnant, so what if we pull out early? The prophet said, do you really do that? It's better for you not to do it, because no soul which Allah has destined to exist, uh, I'm sorry, no soul, no soul that which Allah has destined to exist, but will surely come into existence. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you pull out or not, because if Allah wants them to be born, they'll be born. No, he doesn't condemn the sexual intercourse, he condemns pulling out. These are specifically female captives who have just been caught, who they want to sell. And this is found in Sayyid Bukhari, number 34. So this is explicating exactly what the Quran is saying when it says uh, what it means by captives who are allowed, or those whom their right hands possess. Bukhari, the most trustworthy book according to Muslims, makes it clear. We find something similar in Sahih al-Muslim. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri reported that at the Battle of Hunayn, Allah's Messenger sent an army to Altas and encountered the enemy and fought with them, having overcome them and taken them captives. Okay, so he's just captured these guys. The companions of Allah's Messenger seemed to refrain from having intercourse with the captive women because their husbands were polytheists. Okay, so they're not worried about having sex with these women for any reason except that their husbands are polytheists. They're unclean. Then Allah Most High said, don't even worry about that. All, and women already married except those whom your right hands possess. So he essentially said, you guys are not having sex with these women for some reason or another. Don't worry about it. Feel free to do so. That's found in Sahih al-Muslim. That, again, was the thing I simply could not overlook as a Muslim. When I was reading these sources, when I was understanding what the Quran meant, this is found in the Quran. This is found in Sahih Bukhari. This is found in Sahih Muslim. It's not something we can just throw out. It's at the most trustworthy level of Islamic history, according to Muslims. 
uh, and it's just a bit too ugly. There are also some spiritual issues at play here. Um, and, okay, I'll, I'll power through these. We talked about yesterday how Muslims saw the initial revelation. You remember how Muhammad was in the cave of Hira, he's praying, he's fasting, uh, potentially fasting, I, I'm sorry, he was definitely praying though. Um, and an angel comes to him, Gabriel, and embraces him and says, recite. You remember that story from yesterday? Here's what the sources actually say. Now that's how Muslims generally tell it to each other, that's how I had heard it from childhood. But here's what the sources actually say. Muhammad, while sitting in the cave, all of a sudden was visited by a spiritual being. That being grabbed him so forcefully and squeezed him so tightly that Muhammad thought he was going to die. At this point, that spiritual being says, recite, ikra, and Muhammad says, I don't know how to recite. So the spiritual being grabs him again and squeezes him so tightly, Muhammad thinks he's about to die. Then it lets go. And he says, recite, and he says, I don't know how. A third time, squeezes him so tightly he thinks he's gonna die. And then he says, recite, and Muhammad says, okay, fine. What then shall I recite? He doesn't say, okay, fine, but he says, what then shall I recite? <laughs> so what you have here, oh, let me finish the story. Uh, that is when the angel gives him the first verses of Surah Al-Alaq, uh, verse nine, chapter 96 of the Quran. So chronologically, Chapter 96 of the Quran is the first. Um, Muhammad then runs out of the cave and he goes to his wife and he says, cover me or smother me because I am possessed either by a demon or a poet. He said that. Um, and his wife says, tell me what happened. She brings a blanket and she covers him. Um, and so the shaking stops. And he says to her what happened. And she says to him, no, 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 you're not possessed. This was the angel Gabriel that came to you. Um, over the next few years, the Fatrat e Wahi that we talked about, uh, where Muhammad did not go into public ministry, he just talked to his friends. Over those few years, according to Sahih al Bukhari, Muhammad would go to mountaintops and try to throw himself off and commit suicide because he hadn't received any further message from this angel. At those times, just when he's about to throw himself off the top of the mountain, an angel would appear and say, do not kill yourself, I am an angel. So for the next two or three years after that, Muhammad thought he might be possessed and he was depressed and he tried to commit suicide multiple times. This is found in Sahih Bukhari. Uh, if you wanna ask where it was, I think it's book number nine, hadith number 111. Uh, I will double check during the break though. This is problematic. You do not see any of the prophets of God in the Old Testament or the New Testament responding to inspiration in this way. Quite the opposite. Yeah, you do have people who fear the Lord, um, but you don't have people who get depressed and suicidal. Uh, the only person that we see who follows that kind of pattern is Judas. The spirit of Satan comes upon him he does something, he realizes it was wrong, he gets depressed and effectively commits suicide. Muhammad himself thinks that the first time he receives this revelation, he may be possessed. This is problematic. No matter how you look at it, this is problematic. Um, for those of you who are in the class, you watched the debate. It was a required debate between David Wood and Ali Atay. That's available online. Um, again, if you receive the curriculum for this course, whether you're in the course or not, take a look at the curriculum and uh, watch this debate. It's for free online or you could purchase it off of Amazon. Ali Atay defends this. He says, he, he has to admit that this is an accurate source because it's in Sayyid Bukhari. But he defends it by saying, Muhammad was scared and of course we would all be scared if something like that happened to us. That's pretty weak. Um, I, I don't think it would look like that. Another difficult thing are the satanic verses. Now this could be a whole day's lecture in itself, but we have to keep it short. Early on in Muhammad's time um, in Mecca, there are multiple sources which indicate that while Muhammad was preaching, he said um, that it was okay to bow to the three exalted cranes 
Alat al Uzza and Al Manat. These are three goddesses that the Meccans worshipped at that time. So while leading prayer, in other words, while reciting Quran, Muhammad received a revelation which said, It is okay for you to bow to these three exalted cranes, Alat al Uzza al Manat. The Meccans, upon hearing this, rejoiced. Again, remember, the Meccans are against Muhammad's monotheism. Um, it's going to destroy their commerce. When they hear Muhammad say this, they rejoice, and all of a sudden, everyone bows together. Meccans and Muslims alike, they bow together. Everyone's of one accord. As the story goes, Muhammad left that area and then was rebuked by Allah. Allah said, what is this you have done? I'm accounting to you, by the way, what the Muslim sources say. What is this you have done? And Muhammad is, is frightened. And Allah says, that which you recited was not for me, it was from Satan. And so Muhammad goes back and he tells everyone, that verse was from Satan. Um, and then Allah assuages Muhammad. He says, don't worry. All prophets have accidentally recited things from Satan because Satan plays with their desires. And that verse is still found in the Quran today. The, uh, the part about the exalted cranes is not found in the Quran, but the verse about um, Satan who was able to throw things into the desires of the other prophets, that is found in the Quran today. When you look at the number of sources that say this, it is pretty astounding. 38 sources in early Islamic history recount this event. If you want to see a detailed treatment of this issue, um, there was a, a PhD uh, out of Harvard, or Yale, was it? I think it was Harvard, um, whose name is Shahab Ahmed. Shahab Ahmed. He wrote his dissertation on the Satanic verses. He himself is Muslim, and he concluded that the Satanic verses, because of the historical record, are accurate. This actually happened. So as a Muslim, he concludes that this happened. Uh, if you want to read his dissertation, Shahab Ahmed, um, you can find it online. I think through ProQuest, you'd be able to re uh, request it directly from Harvard. S-H-A-H-A-B, last name is A-H-M-A-D, I believe. And if you're in the class, I'll see if I can't send this to um, Professor Lewis so he can upload it onto Blackboard. You know, I might have actually already done that. Uh, you should check and see if it's on Blackboard under the files. Yep? Do you know the uh, reference in the Quran uh, where it talks about the... Uh... I'll look it up for you. I don't know offhand. Now, there's a lot that goes into play with the Satanic verses. Most Muslims throw it out because it's uh, not found in the Sahih. Uh, it's not found in Sahih, it's not found in Sunan Abu Dawud, it's not found in the most trustworthy source of Hadith. And it's pretty clear why it's not found. It puts Muhammad in a very negative light. Um, so when it comes to the criterion of embarrassment, um, this causes a lot of problems, but you have to wonder why it's found in any Muslim sources at all if it was a fabrication. Uh, a lot of Muslims defend this by saying that it is what is called an Israeliyat, which means something that the Jews were able to uh, penetrate into Islamic tradition. Um, a lot of things are accounted for as Israeliyat, uh, the Jews messing with Muslim tradition. Uh, a good account for how that happened is never really provided, um, but you'll see that a lot, and the satanic verses are given as an account of that. One last thing, real quick, um, is that Muhammad himself admitted to being the victim of black magic. Uh, he said for a period of uh, about a year, if not more, uh, he believed he was having sexual intercourse with his wives when he in fact was not. Um, and uh, when confronted about this, he realized that he had been under black magic. which, of course, was also the doing of Jews. Um, so, regardless of whether or not this actually happened, it's problematic that it's in the sources, and it's in some trustworthy sources. All of these issues, by the way, are brought up in David's debate with Aliyate. So, if you want to watch that debate, I think it's one of the best debates on Muhammad. It's very hard to find a good debate on Muhammad because most Muslims don't even allow you to bring him to the table. Uh, if you want to go debate, one of the caveats for most Muslim debaters is I'll debate whatever you want as long as you don't talk about Muhammad. Uh, it's very interesting. I've run into that a lot. Um, I've done 16 public debates with Muslims, um, and this was said to me uh, usually on most of those debates. 
Um, my parents have told me, though, never to, to talk about Muhammad, um, and for a long time I honored that. So I've never debated that issue publicly, but in sessions like this, um, I'll talk about Muhammad. So in conclusion, on the historical Muhammad, Really, when we're honest with the sources, when we come at it scholastically, we have to conclude that the sources for the historical Muhammad are of dubious reliability. We just can't know much about Muhammad with certainty. Now, we can know some about Muhammad with not much certainty, um, but when it comes to being relatively sure, it's hard because so many of the sources are infiltrated with fabrications that it's hard to extricate that which is accurate. But if we do trust the sources, as Muslims often do, the picture that they paint of Muhammad is not flattering, and we really end up with a dilemma. Why should we accept Muhammad if these hadith are accurate, if these sita are accurate? But if, there's, if they are not to, be trustworthy, uh, not to be trusted, then there is no reason to accept him as a prophet. The shahada, which says, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, the uh, first pillar of Islam, the rallying call of Islam. There's no basis for it if we throw out the Hadith and the Sita. But if we accept the Hadith and the Sita, you really can't conclude that he's a prophet because they say so many negative things about him. Those are the two horns of the dilemma there. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.